Hey folks, and welcome to another exciting episode of Bridging the Gap, the show that helps you teenagers and parents hopefully understand each other a little bit better, get a little bit clearer on things that are going on, and ultimately give you guys a step-by-step plan on how to work better together as a family. I am one half of your hosting team, John Morris, and I want to welcome the awesome co-host that I have in Alicia Madonna. Alicia, welcome. How are you doing today? Hello, everybody. I'm great. I'm good weekend, well rested, ready to take on this week. And I'm getting a puppy this weekend. So Ooh, that's really exciting. That's very exciting. I saw the photo you put up on Facebook the other day and that was so cute. What kind of uh, puppy is it? He is a Boston Terrier and my dog Larry right now is his full brother. So I couldn't pass it up. Wow, that's so awesome. That is so awesome. We also should say, actually, Alicia's suffering a little bit today with a migraine, so we really, really appreciate her being on, because this was a show that I did not want to do without her, um, because we're going to be talking about a topic today, folks, that has caused some controversy all over the world, for sure. Um, It's caused some controversy even among our Facebook and Instagram audience, and it's all about LGBTQI, hopefully I'm not missing anything out, being taught within schools. Now, um, obviously I'm here in the UK, so I'll be talking from a United Kingdom perspective and a little bit more of an understanding. And Alicia's in the US as well, and she's gonna be talking from a US perspective. it's a really interesting topic. Alicia, before we started doing research, how much did you know about all of the stuff that was going on with the LGBTQI movement? I honestly, I knew what I saw on social media. I'll be very honest. I went through school in a very different time. It wasn't taught. Um, Honestly, sex education, like just normal sex education wasn't I mean, it was taught, but it it wasn't emphasized. And I feel like I wasn't as well prepared as I could have been. So all of these new changes are very, very, very new and different to me. And I'm just trying to keep up from what I see on social media. And and I agree. I mean, the the first um, exposure that I had to it was as a youth worker in 2000 and maybe 14, 2015, when I started to notice a big change. Um, maybe even earlier than that, now I'm thinking about it. And it it was a literal case of, you know, teenagers seem to um, talk about their, you know, sexual preference a lot more. They they talked about their gender a lot more. And initially as a youth worker that, again, like yourself, was raised, you know, in a traditional way, you know, I'm I'm from the 80s. And, uh, you know, it it was a thing of... it was never talked about, it never happened, you know, and then all of a sudden it started happening, it started happening really quickly. And then one night, two of the kids that I was probably closest to um, announced <laughs> to everybody, hey, I'm bisexual, or, you know, and, uh, you know, one of them was uh, going through transgender uh, process. And you think, oh, it's a bit tongue in cheek and everything. And then it ended up being so much more. And uh, our world has changed really, really quickly, obviously, with all that's going on. Um, I don't know how it is for you guys in the United States, but I know over here, it's been um, a bone of massive contention between the communities and the, the families as well, for sure. Definitely the the same kind of climate here. You seem to have very extreme polar opposites yeah. and there doesn't seem to be very many people that sit right in the middle and I think the people that are sitting in the middle are being quiet yeah. and they don't want to talk about it because it's such a hot topic yeah. right now. And, and I agree with that. Um, but the good thing is, you know, we've never been, you know, two people <laughs> that are known for sitting and being quiet. And I don't think it's our responsibility to either. Um, so folks, you know, but before we, we start, I know that there's going to be a lot of people that are expecting answers and all these different things. The first thing you got to know is there are no answers. Um, everybody has an answer, um, but there is no clear, crystal clear answer. Hopefully, though, um, I will put into practice with our audience um, a teaching that I've tried to put into practice in my, in my own life for a long time, and it's all about perspective, and we're, we're going to be talking about that a lot. Um, I went through literally hours and hours and hours of interviews and written documents and all, I think maybe about 10 or 15 pages of notes before I had to sit there and say, okay, what what are the root causes here? Um, I tried to get it down to five. I don't think I could get, get, get it down to less than 10. Um, I don't know how you did. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, was, I don't I don't yeah definitely there was no. just notes and notes and notes on top of everything for sure um so folks to, to let you guys know what we're talking about here th- this is really important of course so 
Last week, we, uh, Alicia and I had a conversation at the beginning of the show, and it was surrounding a minister who was deemed to be a terrorist after delivering a sermon. Um, and if you haven't had the chance to see that part of the show, go back into last week's show. You'll get to see it in its entirety. But it was at Trent College in Nottingham. And this minister had gone in, like so many ministers done, um, gave a, a sermon and a talk and basically said, you don't have to accept LGBTQI ideologies. Um, he also then went on to talk about, you know, loving thy neighbor and being tolerant and all sorts of other things. And again, you can check it out on YouTube um, if you desire to do so. So it's, it really stemmed from there. And obviously, this is such a big thing. You know, and, and I've got to be honest, you know, la as of last week, you know, if, if someone had said to me, John, do you think it should be taught in schools? My answer would have been instantly, no. Kids don't need to know about sex. Um, and the fact that they're being taught at five years old, you know, I felt very much it was really inappropriate. However, I did what a lot of people do, which was that knee-jerk reaction. But I did also what a lot of people don't, which was to go away and research and actually educate myself about this. And some of the answers that I've been seeing on Facebook in the past week have been a, as a result of people that are, uh, how can I put it politely, you know, very stuck in one way of, of thinking without actually, you know, looking and, and saying, look, our world is changing. Like it or not, it is changing. And it's important to educate children um, to those changes. So to prepare them for the world. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about it. Like I say, quite a lot um, for sure. We're going to be looking at transgender. We're going to be looking at the uh, the, the main core issues that are there as well. And um, Alicia, I want to ask you, you know, what are things like in the USA regarding this whole movement um, within schools that you found out? So like we talked about just previously, I didn't have much of an idea of what it was going on. I knew what was happening through social media, as well as through my boyfriend's son, who just kind of filters in what he deals with. But honestly, I didn't really know. So what I found is there is a push um, to, by August, have yeah. um, LGBTQ um, education kind of in, ingrained in yeah. sex education. Um, there's a lot of states that are pushing against it. Yeah. Um, New York is, they have the bill out. It's, it's not passed yet. There's a lot of uh, backlash against it. Um, but what I did find is in the states that are having an issue with it, there is this clause that the teachers are gonna have to give a 30 day notice mm -hmm. anytime they talk about anything um, sexual related, anything LGBTQ related, anything like that. And then the parents will have an option to opt their kids out of it okay. at no penalty. I don't know how you feel about that. I am an I think I'm opposed to that. I don't think I like that because now you're now you're separating kids when there's already a separation issue as already like outside of the LGBTQ issue. And that's just going to now further that even more. I hate to say it, but it's unfortunately a lot of Southern states that are fighting this issue. Yeah. And it's not an unusual trend. <laughs> I, I find it interesting, actually, because over here in the UK, um, it is going to be a case of law that your children will not have a chance from August um, to opt out. They will be taught uh, regardless. Um, which, you know, from what Alicia was saying, obviously it's slightly different here in the fact that parents will not be given the option, which is one of the things that I know um, many people are furious about, um, are doing uh, in some ways peaceful and unpeaceful protests um, uh, all across the United Kingdom. And um, it, it's caused a massive amount of upset and outrage because the, the rights parents feel are being taken away from them. Um, the interesting thing about this, and we'll talk about this in, in depth later on, um, parents want the schools to teach uh, sex education because they don't feel qualified or able to teach it themselves. And, you know, my personal thing, folks, is parents, it's part of your job. You need to up your game. 
Um, at the end of the day, you know, it is your responsibility to teach them. And if you don't want someone else teaching them, then you need to do the job yourself. That's the first thing. Um, the, the second thing is, uh, with, with regards to rights being taken away, again, we, we live in a world, and I'm going to circle back to Alicia's question in the moment, I'm, I'm, I am getting there, but I, I just want to, <laughs> to put some things out there that obviously stack it, you know, even further. Um, we live in a world where people are not that receptive to change unless they cause it for themselves. Um, we've covered that in other shows. So from that point of view, when somebody says, you know, your children are going to be educated in the ways of LGBTQI ideologies, um, whether you like it or not, naturally there is going to be backlash. Um, and because, I think because of a lack of communication, a lack of transparency as to what's being taught, how it's being taught and, and who it's being taught by, a lot of people are naturally really, really cross. And that's one of the first things that I've got on my, my list is, is a lack of transparency and communication between the parents and between the schools. Um, now to get back to Alicia's point, now that I've provided you guys with some facts as to, to what's going on, um, it, it, it's one of those things that I sat and I, and I really, all of this stuff, folks, I really, you know, tried to see it from both polar opposites, um, from the LGBTQI side, from the um, faith-based communities, from the political communities, from, you know, from all of these different areas and tried to get somewhere in the middle. And I think, you know, I think oftentimes it's the parents that's got the issue. Um, and again, I know we're unpacking everything here all at once. I think a lot of it's the parents that have got the issue. The children, more often than not, will accept majoritively what's there. There will be some kids that say, well, why is this being taught? I would love personally, if, if a child was able to say, well, my faith, you know, and that's what a lot of it, and again, we'll talk about this. Uh, my faith says that this is wrong. Um, if you are Christian, if you are Jew, if you are Muslim and other religions around there, they teach that marriage is for the sole purpose of, uh, you know, families and creation and, and um, babies and children, and everything else. And, you know, they look at it from that point of view and say, well, this does not line up with my faith that I've had for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. The flip side of that is you can't expect a non-believer um, to act as if you were a believer. So you can't expect them to uphold your ideologies when they don't agree with them. <laughs> oh, and that's part of the problem why so many people now are getting away from religions. Um, I think, you know, if, if I'm honest, it, it is important to educate children for sure as to what's going on. I think it's how it's done. And I think yeah. it's who it's done by. Um, and I think it, it's where it's done. And the, the parents need to be more than ever really aware on this. But what do you think, Alicia? I've, I've done a lot of rabbiting, so... I, I agree with you. I I actually am on the side of, um, I think it should start to be integrated into the education system. Kind of how I mentioned previously, I don't think, I don't think our, at least here in the States, I don't think our sex education is up to par. I feel like I was kind of tossed out into the world kind of like with this half knowledge okay. of, of things. So I think not only do we need to up our game and just, you know, sex education in general, but I do think that adding in the LGBTQ component of it is very important because it's part of our world now. We can't, we can't shove it back in yeah. the box. There's, there is no doing that. So I think the best approach is to educate as best we can our children, um, not make any permanent rash decisions, but to just be supportive and be there and let them talk. I feel like that's, sometimes really hard for parents they yeah. they just want they just want to tell and, mm -hmm. and push and teach which granted that's what you're told to do as a parent but at the flip side you really have to listen to your kids and hear what they're struggling with yeah. and I think another thing at least here in the states that parents struggle with a lot is there's this taboo or this like um I don't know stereotype around parents that bring their kids to any kind of counselor, any mm -hmm. kind of therapy, and it's looked at terribly. Yeah. And that's something that I know, I know that we're working on it with older mm -hmm. demographics. Like as, as adults, we're all trying to be like, you know, therapy is normal. Going to see a counselor is normal and fine. I really feel like we need to start it like pushing that yeah. on our 
with our kids, if, if your child is having an issue that you feel like you are not qualified to deal with, and that's fine. Like, I feel like so many parents get, feel like they need to be the expert in everything. And that's just not reality. Like you just can't be. And sometimes you have to know when to ask for help. And if your child is going through something, I think that asking for help sometimes is the best thing you can yeah. do for them. Yeah, and, and I would agree. I think as well, you know, that, uh, you know, a lot of people are now getting away from the phrase of psychologist or counselor or therapist. You seem certainly what we're trying to bring over to the UK is a lot more in the, in the phraseology of coaching. So I'm labeled as, or I label myself as a, li- a personal development coach. Um, that basically covers all aspects, as opposed to I'm a psychologist. Um, even though that's what I'm training in, I'm also training in four other different areas. Um, and I think it's very important to get away from that stigma, like Alicia said. The other thing as well is that parents have a vision for what they want for the kids. And particularly, you know, stereotypically, you know, men have usually a very, very strong view of what they want for their children. And if it doesn't line up with it, um, you know, oftentimes that, that child is shunned or, or treated as a, you know, an outcast. And it, it's a very weird and bizarre thing. And obviously, if that's happening with a child within school, uh, the, their parents don't accept them. I think it is important to have um, a place where the, the child is able to say, you know, I have been shunned by my parents. I have been, you know, uh, kicked out of that family society and, and I need a place where I've, you know, where I've got support for sure. Um, I think it's absolutely, you know, um, I think it's, it's vital to, to anybody. Um, you know, sorry, go on. One thing I want to add to that is, and this is a little bit outside the LGBTQ realm that we're talking about, but something that I've noticed here is any kind of disability at all is parents are so scared Mm -hmm. to go get their just just to go get their kid tested to see if they have some kind of disability Mm -hmm. that can be the simplest of disabilities from dyslexia which actually i have Mm -hmm. to you know adhd to um autism i mean the spectrum is huge and there is this really deeply ingrained fear of what will you find out and how will you have to, and it really, I think boils back down to what is the parent going to have to do after they find it out. So I just wanted to throw that in there because it, I, I, well, I know we'll talk certainly about the, the mindset later on, um, but I think following up of that, what people need to know and um, parents, if I can encourage you with anything would be um, it, it's better to get your test and your results of your child done early. And I mean, really early. The reason I say that is, and I know there's this stigma, oh, so-and-so's got this, so-and-so's got that. You know, we still are trying to live in this world of keeping up appearances from the Victorian era where nothing ever went wrong, nothing ever happened, which is a complete load of nonsense. But what parents often forget, and people in general often forget is this. If you get something when it's small, so that size, it's much easier than if it's this size or, you know, the size of a house. Um, Because what happens is when you deal with it, when it's small, it's that tiny little snowball, you know, that little bit of friction, it's easier to deal with. When it becomes this huge avalanche, however, of, you know, anxiety breakdowns or severe depression or severe self-harming or whatever it might be, it's because, not because, oh my goodness, that person all of a sudden has broken out, no. It's because they've been fighting this for a long time and probably suppressing it um, so as they don't appear that way to other people. And this is what's happened, you know, and and it's that bit of friction that keeps going and going and going. As I I described the other night and uh, on our teen life coaching course, if you rub your hands together like this for a few minutes, well, they're going to get hot. If you rub your hands together for two or three hours, they're going to start to blister. If you do this for a week solid, well, the chances are by the end of it, you're going to be rubbing bone. Now, Why am I saying that? Because you've got to notice when friction is rubbing and how it's building and how it's developing. And if you don't do anything about it, you know, eventually you'll end up rubbing away your entire hands and you'll just sit doing this and it just goes on and on and on. Um, So it's really important. And I think that's a fantastic point, Alicia, to to bring up is, you know, I, I think we have somehow got to get away from this keeping of appearances stuff. We have got to realize that everything... Yeah, every issue that we have, believe it or not, happens inside of us. We take on stuff for sure. But when we can't talk about it 
and we can't think about it and there's nobody there that will listen or understand or anything um, because of religious views, because of traditional mindset, because of keeping up appearances, whatever it might be, um, then that just creates more pressure, more tension. And believe it or not, that is what's leading to so many teenage suicides um, around the world is because either they've been diagnosed and it's gone, you know, ignored, oh, it's not that bad, or you know, it, it's a case of, you know, it doesn't get diagnosed and all of a sudden they just snap, you know, so th th there's a lot of things for sure. Um, but no, that, that's, that's a great point for sure. Um, I think, you know, I've, I've got a couple of notes down here, folks. So whenever I'm looking off to the side, it, it's picking up the next uh, topic. I think, okay, let, let's look at this. Do you think, Alicia, that people, more to the point, parents would be more um, accepting and understanding as to why LGBTQI should be taught in schools if they had actually been communicated with, as opposed to it, it was just dropped on them, apparently? Yes. And I also think that <clears throat> I think parents need proper education because, Correct. I mean, we haven't, we didn't get it. No, as as kids. So as these kids go through, they'll they'll be able to parent better because they'll have had the exposure and, you know, the education. Yeah. I think the first step in all of this is to educate the parents so that they are aware and they know what type of education is given to their kids. Correct. And then they're given the chance to bring up any um, issues, worries, concerns that they may have. And then that can then feed back into the narrative of how it's educated mm -hmm. and how well, how it's taught to our kids. Um, I, I really think that, like you said, it needs to be, I think it just needs to be this fostered, ever-changing, fluid thing that, you know, we have to be receptive and understanding of people's views and, and opinions, but we also you know, we need to consider everybody. Like, I feel like a lot of times we just consider, we consider this group yeah. thinking that it's the whole when it's this, there's another entire group that's being quiet yeah. that, you know, we have to consider them as well. Um, so that, that's my take on it when it comes to parents. And, and I agree. Um, and, and, you know, like I say, because if, if anybody had said to me, oh, we're going to be teaching, you know, about sex education in school, my initial thing, believe it or not, was, well, as soon as you teach about it, you know, Kids want to know <laughs> the practical side of it, which is why there are so many young teenage pregnancies that are going on. Um, because again, it's like you put food in front of a hungry person, he's going to eat, you yeah. know, kids going through all these hormonal changes and stuff, you know, this is going on, this is happening. Um, I do feel like, like Alicia said, you know, that it definitely, definitely needs to be educated better. Uh, because if someone had said, you know, again, well, we're teaching about sex education and we're going to be talking about people that are gay, people that are lesbian, people that are transgender to five-year-old children, which is what's happening. Um, and they're explaining the family dynamic for sure. They're not, as far as I'm aware, it might be different in the States, but in the UK, um, the government um, view on this is that they're teaching more about families and relationship. They are not teaching about the sexual act and aspect. Now, whether they do that later in sex education, I don't know. Um that would be a you know a very very interesting thing actually to um to, to to try and find out you know in terms of sex ed how far it's now going um for sure i don't know i i actually i didn't find any of that mm -hmm. well, the one thing that i did find um is that let me find it um for new york um their goal for this this bill that's coming out in august is that everything will be age appropriate okay medically accurate okay. and LGBTQ inclusive. Okay. That's what I gathered from my research. So as to what exactly that means, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but so my, my opinions and my views on this are, I think that in, in primary schools and elementary schools, I think that we need to teach more of an emotional, mm -hmm. more of the uh, general inclusiveness of just because somebody's different doesn't mean you should push them away. I think that once you get into like middle school, high school, I feel like that's when you should start teaching more of like the sexual stuff. And I I understand where you're coming from with once you once you kind of open that can of worms, it's hard to push back. Um, however, I will say, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I will say though, from from my perspective, so I had a really weird 
um, preteen into teen years because I was moving. I moved from here to Texas. I was 11 turning 12 when that happened. So I went through all of those big years. Um, sex education in Texas is a lot different. I remember being shoved into the gym with the entire school Oh wow! and just shown a projector of whatever it is the video was. Yeah. And I remember all of us were like, this is stupid. We're not going to pay attention. And so we weren't given the information properly. And I feel like I definitely went out into, because so, so that's a case where the can of worms was opened, but it wasn't properly taught. Wasn't properly explained to us how to navigate yeah. at your age and going into other ages, how you're gonna feel, mm -hmm. how you should act, and how you should protect yeah. yourself. Um, so I definitely went out into the sexual world very blind. <laughs> um, so as much as I kind of agree with, you know, it's hard once you open up that can of worms. I really believe that that can of worm is yeah. gonna get opened up. Yeah. anyways in middle yeah. school I mean especially now kids have so many resources that's exactly what I was gonna about say. it yeah so I think if we can jump the gun teach them real real early at yeah. like beginning of middle school this is what you're going to start feeling this is what you're going to start dealing with this is how you deal with it yeah. I think that would make a huge change in teenage pregnancies teenage um sexual abuse yeah I think all of that because because a lot of times, especially with young girls, they just don't even know what's what's okay and what's not okay. Because yeah. we're pretty much just inundated with what we read and see on TV. Yeah. And so there's a lot of issues in that already. But my my position on it is middle school, I think early middle school, start teaching them young, mm -hmm. teach them how to deal with their emotions. Don't just like throw all this content. I feel like a lot of times, you're just like throwing this content of like STDs, yeah. pregnancy, and it freaks you out. It scares you. And so then you kind of just like shut off and you're like, I don't even want to talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's how we approach it as well too. Yeah, yes, you have to talk about that stuff, but let's really talk about how are you feeling? Yeah. Like, what are you feeling and how, well, how are we going to act on that? Correct. I, and I, I completely agree with that. Um, again, I think you know, I, I was going to say this for later on, but you know, the, the reality is that, you know, you've people sitting on these governing boards and in the nicest way possible to them. Um, I doubt very much that they have done a ton of research themselves from a psychological, philosophical, theological, you know, point of view, whatever. Um, and then every area that falls into that, they're just being fed information. Um, they've, you know, some of them may have been, but a lot of them that I have known personally have gotten education enough to put them on that place. And then they're saying, well, this is what I think is right for the children. This is what, you know, and it goes back to the issue we were talking about last week, you know, of, of uh, this is our ideology and this is what we're going to do and so on and so forth. But the reality is, um, you know, human beings, you know, allegedly, I, I, I doubt this sometimes, but human beings allegedly are the highest form of intelligence on the planet. Um, you look at some of the folks in power and you really, really wonder. <laughs> but the, the reality is that they want to know all about the cosmos. They want to know all about, you know, uh, physics and engineering and everything. But, you know, we've been given this incredible body, but no one has taken the time or very few people have taken the time to actually learn how to use it. Um, and, you know, so, so when folks are saying, oh, well, we should do this, we should do that. Again, the government has got a great history worldwide of jumping the gun and just putting these things out there. Um, and I think that certainly needs to be addressed. And like Alicia was saying, uh, and as, as I've echoed that, you know, it, it, it is how it's uh, taught. And I think it's, you know, because again, with the amount of stuff that's available on the internet, kids are going to find out one way or another. You know, um, in some schools, believe it or not, it's actually encouraged to use the Internet and all of its stuff there as a resource. Now, that I don't agree with. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is this is the world in which we're living in um, and, and kind of following that up. You know, it's important to know that our world has changed. And it's not like it was years ago. Years ago, when Alicia and I used to go to school, you know, it, it was a case of you go to school to get a broad overview of subjects that would, you know, hopefully get you a better job, you know, and make you a more valuable commodity on the marketplace. Now, 
you need to be prepared for what's going on out in the world, whether whether you meet an LGBTQI person or whether you meet, you know, someone in business and how are you going to communicate with them? Um, and it, it, it is more of a, you know, more than just a job now. Our world and society has changed. Uh, I know I, I wrote this down that, you know, the UK used to be known as a Christian country. Um, now it's known as a British country that upholds British values and, uh, and, and British law. Now, what that means, I have no idea because I didn't get that far in the research. But it's interesting how it, all of that has changed. And... You know, I, I can understand from both points of view how we can think, oh, wait, we could be right. But as I'm going to do an experiment with uh, Alicia in a moment, um, it's a very simple one. You don't need to worry. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it shows that maybe we need to be a little bit more open to, to what's going on. Um, yes, I think for, for some people, there have to be limits. Um, because if you're a person of faith, then a lot of stuff that's going on does contradict. Uh, and that's that is a hard thing for sure. Um I don't know how things have changed, certainly in the States, if they have, Alicia, um, and what your thoughts are. Um, it's, it's tricky. I feel like it is kind of the same in a lot of ways. I kind of talked about, I, I hate to do this, but there's like a North and South. I, yeah. There really is <laughs> such a divide still, and especially having lived both in the North and the South, you really still get that and like the belief system that's in place in in both because obviously the south is very religious is you the bible belt yeah yeah you find a lot of baptists um so this is just a little side note um i'm i grew up catholic i'm, I'm not really a practicing catholic but when i moved to dallas texas there was all of one catholic church in the entire <laughs> city and so obviously you're, you know, the minority, but, but still religion there is so yeah. big and important. Um, and it's funny because now we're finding that there's like this North and South belief. And then there's also this like West coast belief that is now starting to like creep in. And the West coast seems to be the very progressive, mm -hmm. very like open, um, uh, inclusive kind of mindset. And I just think of I think that's probably more of the direction that we should be going yeah. anyways <laughs> to begin with. So I think that's my kind of thinking on that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, one of the points that I picked up was, you know, people's unwillingness to change. And I think it is important to circle back to this. Um, people feel uh, that they have the answer. You know, you go to any church, especially if you're a Christian denomination, my goodness, there's at least a hundred different denominations and every one of them feels that they are the one. Um, but I want to do an experiment with Alicia right now. And, and uh, I love doing this experiment because it, it illustrates very simply uh, what we're talking about. Alicia, I'm going to show you a Rubik's cube. Okay. Yeah. And I want you to tell me what you see on the top line. Okay. So, that's nice and clear. We had some technical issues earlier on, folks, but it's nice and clear now. So just the top line. You want like the colors? Yeah. What colors do you see? Yellow, blue, yellow. I blue. totally disagree. I see two greens and a blue. <laughs> now, what does that just prove, folks? Now, imagine you're stuck and this is all you can see is this side. That's all Alicia can ever see is the, the top line of that. And all I can see is my top line. Now, I can disagree with Alicia until I'm blue in the face. However, it doesn't change the fact that her colors are yellow, blue, yellow, and my colors are two greens and a blue. Now, what does that mean? It means actually, if she was to tell me and I was to tell her, and we had someone from this side telling us and someone from this side telling us and the top and the bottom telling us, guess what? We could see the whole picture. But because oftentimes we want, did you like how I did that? <laughs> that is a beautiful, beautiful metaphor. I, I love, love doing that one. It's all about perspective. <laughs> Um, but, but folks, honestly, once we're able to have the conversation in a non-threatening or non-argumentative way, um, you can actually find out a heck of a lot about another person's beliefs, why they are the way they are, even if you don't agree with them. Yeah. You know, I'm sure there's practices I have that Alicia is a bit like, what? And probably yeah. vice versa. Yeah. Um, you know, and I guarantee you folks that are watching this, you'll have practices that I don't, you know, well, I mean, I really don't care, to be honest with you, you know, <laughs> but you'll have, uh, and, and I'll have practices that you're probably a bit like, um, okay, don't get that. But does it mean that we have to start a war over it? Does it mean that we have to start fighting? Wars start and, and really begin due to a lack of communication. And, you know, 
one of the things, because again, I wrestled with this, you know, in, in scripture and in the Bible and, and for, for Muslims and, and, and other faiths, you know, again, they want to hold to the, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 year old traditions and, and things that they've held very, very near and dear. And I can respect that for sure. Um, as someone who's worked for the church and been on both sides of it, obviously I see both as it is. Um, but projecting in the future, a hundred years from now, it'll be very similar to the way religions have been, you know, in the past. It'll be a case of if this goes ahead, a hundred years from now, this conversation will just be a thing that happened. Hopefully, hopefully, children that are, well, it'd be children's great 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 grandchildren probably a hundred years from now will be a case of you know more tolerant, more accepting, more loving more open to things that are going on because i'll be honest folks you know from the experiences that i've had and this may not be popular but it's my view it's my experience it's my you know it's our show so we can say what we want on it um but the reality is that religions have been very inclusive very quick to kick people out um in a lot of ways and very judgmental about a lot of things that don't line up with their ideologies um now, that being said, I do feel, yes, it's important. Everything has its place. But, you know, it, it's important for, you know, a religion or a practice in faith because it gives you stability. It gives you a framework. It gives you an, an ideology, basically, of how the family life is meant to be and how this. But the reality is, oftentimes, it, it isn't that way. You know, the Bible doesn't have anything. If, you're, if your son or daughter comes to you and says, well, I'm transgender, aside from the letters of Paul, which says, well, that's an abomination. They're not the letters of Jesus, you'll be interested to know. Um, you know, and as someone that studied theology for 20 plus years, I look at it and I think, again, I go back to, you know, what would Jesus' reaction be to this? Would he at least have the conversation with people before passing judgment? Or would he just have the conversation full stop with them? You know, and, and that's the thing, when you can understand a person's views, hopefully you can understand how someone thinks, why they are the way they are, what's going on, and it ultimately makes you feel more valued. That's just my thoughts, Alicia. What, what, what about yourself? I really like what you said about if Jesus was actually here and had that conversation, because um, as a historian, mm -hmm. first and foremost, um, that's the kind of stuff that I think about, you know? You know, the Bible is written by just people, normal, yeah. everyday people, but like they're supposedly supposed to be followers and it's not, but do we really know? <laughs> and there is this thought of like, if Jesus was here and he was going through these motions and everything the church tells you, well, how would he really have reacted? So I really love that point. Um, but one thing that I really wanted to, to kind of focus on and this is something that I have definitely seen a little bit more of on social media. I know that I've been trying to do this in my own life, but we need to normalize not agreeing and being okay with it. Yeah. It's just, a, it's, it's based, it's that Rubik's cube idea. Like your perspective is this, my perspective is this. Clearly, if you can't meet in the middle somewhere, there has to be a point at some time where you just have to go, you know what? I can respect your views, your opinions, but those aren't mine. And I hope that you can respect that as well. But at least and, you both understand each other as to how you've arrived at that conclusion. Exactly. And I think that healthy conversation and this quickness to just fight and argue is what's killing these healthy yeah. conversations that could allow people to just open up. It, it's really funny because um, uh, Netflix is starting to just crank out these um, like social experiment reality TV shows. Like I've been recently watching The Circle. I don't know if you know. I, I've heard of it. Yes. Okay. So the idea is you can kind of come in as yourself or you can come in as a catfish and you can kind of build up whoever you want to be. But it's amazing the connections that people can make when there isn't like this false pretense yeah. in front of them. And when it comes to just like a social experiment, it's really fascinating that when you take away all of the social stuff, all of the political everything, when you really strip it down to just being people and just talking to each other, the things you can find out and the things that you actually probably are a lot more similar on Definitely. comes out. And I just think we are so stuck mm -hmm 
um, of arguing. We just want to, we want our point, like you said, to be the point and, and that's it. That's law, that's fact, that's it. But life doesn't work like that. And one thing that actually I learned from history uh, in college, which I think this can be used in every facet of life is there is no one history. There is no one historical fact. My teacher pointed out one time that like, let's say 10 of us are at one big historical event, quote unquote, I'm over here, you're over there, somebody's in the back. All of our accounts of that event could be completely different of what happened. And it's just depends on whose perspective was written down in the history book. So just because it's written down, just because that one person says so, doesn't mean the person across the room had a completely different experience. And I think that is what we really need to get away from is that there's one truth. There is one way. There is not. <laughs> the beauty of the world is that there is not, is that everybody can have their opinion. Everybody can have their view. And we can all in some way, shape or form be right yeah. in, in our own beliefs. So that's my take on it. I think that we just need to start having healthier conversations that aren't rooted in, I just want my point yeah. to be you know, correct. I, and I agree um, with a lot of that, you know, that the interesting thing about it is, you know, when people can have those conversations, it means that they're developing more emotional intelligence, which is what we talked about last week. And I think that's f from the experiment that I did basically on Facebook, just to, to throw the, the dynamite out there. And I asked, you know, people on our Facebook group, um, you know, what do you guys think about LGBTQI? being taught in schools it's hard to remember all the letters now to folks yeah. so if I do forget I do apologize but I think I've covered most of them um but you know what do you guys think about it being taught in in schools and some of the people were saying you know and, and this is even when I specifically said keep your comments polite and be respectful well of course you know what happened they didn't and uh, in, in some cases in, in actually three cases there ended up being a pretty nasty verbal war um that had gone on um one person had commented with all geese are an abomination and it's, you know, this, this and this, um, again, very strong Bible views. Um, now, think about the Bible, folks, because um, like Alicia, I too have studied history. And mm. the thing about the Bible is probably why we get on so well, actually, because we have a lot of <laughs> yeah. similar interests. But the thing about the Bible is this. We have uh, the 66 books now, OK, all the way from Genesis right the way through to the book of Revelation. I wonder how many people actually know that originally, uh, until maybe, I think, if I remember correctly, the 8th century, um, there used to be 88 books of the Bible. And, you know, the, there was a lot of them that was thrown out. Uh, there were certain books that was nearly thrown out, Hebrews and James being two of them, because they didn't seem holy enough. They didn't, you know, relate to God enough. But there was a lot of books that were thrown out there, and you can read about them in the Lost Gospels and, you know, and the... Um, Oh, what the heck's the name? The I've forgotten it. I've got books on it and I can't think what the heck it's called. It ends in letters, but I can't think what it's called. Anyway, um, but you know, all these ancient documents and you wonder how many more documents were thrown away and put in the fire so they would never have been seen. How many documents have been hidden away? Yes, you know, the Bible is there to give you, you know, it, it, some people call it the basic instruction manual before death or, or for, for life or whatever. Um, and, you know, there's a lot in there for sure. Um, and I think it has to be, you know, seen as that. And if you have a practice in faith, I think it is very, very, very important. But when your information that you're taking from, again, you know, one translation of the Bible is, you know, I, I think we just need to be a little bit more aware and awake. And if, you know, again, again, as we believe that Jesus was the son of God and, you know, he's the teaching that you want to follow then if that's the case, then that's the person you need to be listened to. And if you don't understand what Jesus is really all about, read John 13 or John 17, where it's the prayer of Jesus. And, you know, really see what the heart of Jesus is talking about, as opposed to a lot of the other stuff that's there, um, for sure. But anyway, I digress. The other thing as well, um, before we move on from an unwillingness to change, is 2013, this change began and it happens so fast. And like Alicia and I have said for the last couple of weeks, you know, when when human beings get hold of a new piece of software or a new piece of technology or whatever it is, and uh, they use it to the nth degree, 
again, never read the manual, never really understand what's going on. And then maybe 25 years later, they're like, oh my goodness, how do we actually use this damn thing? And 25 years later, they're like, oh wait, we haven't been using this for its correct purpose at all. You know, <laughs> Facebook was designed, believe it or not, to build relationships with your friends. <laughs> me, personally, I meet people all over the world. Um, I don't use it necessarily for its correct purpose, but hey, it makes me a living. So that's the main thing. Um, and it's how Alicia and I actually connected. So, you know, yeah. that, that's a fantastic thing. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, folks, you know, when when all of these changes are going on and you've been raised in such a way, you know, maybe 80s and 90s, uh, you know, and you've been raised in that way that, you know, homosexuals were terrible people, lesbians were not even talked about, transgender didn't even exist. Um, and if they did, they were weird abominations and all that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden in 2013, when I first noticed it, just, just to put that out there before someone comments and, you know, tries to rattle my cage, um, you know, it, it's then all of a sudden this major cultural change. And in less than 10 years, it's now become this humongous movement that a lot of people feel we're just meant to accept, you know, whether we like it or not. And, you know, when it when we're being told, you know, that heterosexuality isn't the norm, when we're being told that LGBTQI, every other letter, NMOPQ, you know, whatever else is in there, um, is, is the norm, and it will be taught in schools, and you won't have a choice about it. I can completely understand why that would pee a lot of parents off. And, you know, when they're being taught, well, you know, religious practice isn't going to be such a, you know, a big thing in, in our schools anymore. Well, it has been for, you know, hundreds and thousands of years. Do you realize it was the, the religions that actually built a lot of the schools? Certainly here, the Church of Scotland is, is massively yeah. responsible for the schools being here. Um, you know, and then we're being asked to adapt really, really quickly. I can completely understand why some people are angry and frustrated. Um, and, you know, from, from their view, that's where a lot of the prejudice are coming from that Alicia was saying earlier on. It's like, this is being taught and now we just have to accept it. I don't know about you, but looking solely from that point of view, I can completely understand why people would be angry. I can too, you know, especially when you're kind of just like thrown this curveball. And and actually, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that schools in the UK are heavily based yeah. on religion because yeah. here religion is not even whispered no, no see that's religion. interesting because when i was there in 2013 they still did the pledge of allegiance in the lord's prayer now maybe two years after so that was 2012 when i was there 2013 whatever it was by 2015 that was gone the first um instance that parents were taught or told about this i believe was in a letter and the same with the lgbtqi movement um, was not in a letter, but it was actually when children were issued homework and they're five years old. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're teaching you about, you know, transgender. Here's some homework on it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what are you so going to do with that? I want to ask you, where did you go that in 2013, the Lord's Prayer was done with the pledge? Okay, so I was I was actually coast to coast, um, and the ones that I know that it was done in Maryland did it, Washington did it. Um, it was being phased schools? out in Washington um, and Colorado, I believe, either had just finished doing it, but a lot of it was still. Um, I, I think th there was still certain schools. I think it depended school by school, um, but I know certainly Maryland because um, we were taken into a school with my author friend who's now passed away. And they stood up and did the Pledge of Allegiance and any big, you know, 4th of July events, it'd be like, I pledge allegiance. And I'm like, okay, this is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm British. I don't know what to do here. <laughs> so were you in a public or a private school? I, now, I believe with one of them, I was in a public school. Um, and then there was two Catholic schools. So naturally they would have said the Lord's Prayer in the Catholic school. I think it was like St. Mary's or something. So that makes sense because from from my childhood and growing up, never, yeah. even like in the 90s, in the early 2000s, when I was going through school, there was no, and I went through public school, mm -hmm. there was no whispers of religion. I mean, it was not even talked about. It was strictly kind of taken out mm -hmm. of the narrative just okay. because of the volatile nature of it. So uh, that's very interesting. That's interesting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have, it's funny, my grandparents, and I think actually my mom too, they all went to Catholic school at some point in their lives. So they have a very different upbringing, which 
I think feeds into yeah. this older demographic Definitely. that has these very stern, stark mm-hmm. ways of believing because of their um, education, young education yeah. in, a, in a Catholic or a religious background. Um, that being said, <clears throat> uh, it's definitely there's, I mean, I have issues with the education system <laughs> as it is. Um, I have I just, issues with anything the government gets a hands on. It's really hard because I, so I was, when I left high school, right after I left high school, um, New York implemented this common core, uh, way of teaching and everything that I gathered from it it was literally like they took it the easy way and they made it hard right yeah to include all learning types but it, it seemed more exclusive than uh-huh. inclusive um so I have issues with how they've been teaching to begin with because I'm like we all turned out fine we all know our ABCs we know how to do math and count and everything now you're just making it way more confusing <laughs> But I do also think that because of that, teachers, and I, and I know this firsthand because I have tons of friends that are teachers, they are absolutely put through the ringer trying to keep to the curriculum that is set out by the state, still teach their kids and actually make sure that the kids really do yeah. learn what they're supposed to learn through the course of their year and then throw in all these social aspects. I mean, that is just too much for one teacher to handle. So I think the school structure in a, as a whole needs to get better because then you have situations like this where all of a sudden kids are just going home with homework mm-hmm. that the parents have no idea about. Yeah. Um, I think there just needs to be more, like mm-hmm. go back to communication. There just needs to be more communication yeah between the school system and the parents, because I really feel like parents are in every aspect Mm -hmm. of schooling, just completely in the dark. I mean, me and Jack hardly ever know what his son is learning in school anymore, unless he tells us. And I get that because obviously he's in high school now, but even like in middle school and elementary school, I just think there needs to be a little bit more, I don't don't know if a newsletter is the right way Mm -hmm. of doing it or like a semester conference or all the teacher and the parents get together I don't know what it is but there just needs to be a better way of communicating between teachers and parents I mean nowadays you you can do the simple thing where you have it on um on on zoom or have it on facebook and post a a monthly or weekly video um now I know there was one um governing body and I'm not going to name them um that basically said oh but we don't have the time for that And it's like, well, I'm sorry, if you don't have the time to invest in the parents that are coming to your schools and the children that are coming to your schools, then it's not surprising why the parents are going to lash out the way they are. And, uh, you know, especially in Muslim communities, uh, certainly down in England, um, you know, and certainly in Christian communities where they're believing their children are being sent to school to learn an education, not to be told as they believe about sexual content. Um, Now, again, we're going to touch in a moment as to what is actually being taught within the curriculum. Um, But again, I I completely agree with you, Alicia, it it comes down to communication and uh, how high you actually value the the people that are you know uh, coming and using your schools and things i think that has to be but i agree i mean the the teaching uh, practice over here that's why there are so many young teachers now that have got into it taught for a few years and are now going private or leaving teaching completely because of the conditions that they're being taught in um it is it's bad it's really bad it's it's really honestly